Today we're going to talk about uh, basement remodeling on a budget. And really what I'm going to do is kind of take you through uh, our process and within the steps of our process kind of explain to you guys what areas uh, if you're working with a design builder such as ourselves how do you manage budget if you're trying to tangle a basement on your own uh, how to simulate some of the steps that we do uh, to try to avoid mistakes and costs overruns and the other things that happen whenever you're changing an older home um, how many of you have pre-1970 homes? Okay, and the rest of you are post-1970 or just here for uh, the entertainment value. Um, somebody uh, came in earlier today and talked about basements in the older homes. And, and part of what starts to happen with a lot of these projects is as soon as you update the walls, as soon as you update the space in any significant way, you fall under code compliance issues, which makes uh, makes it a larger, more complete, uh, better finished project. But uh, people will come in and be like, well, we just want the walls redone. And unfortunately, as we'll get into with that, uh, you get into more than just walls. So we have three design studio locations, St. Paul, Minneapolis, South Minneapolis. This is your closest one. It's also our newest showroom. We have a fair amount of product on display there and designers to help people with selections. Uh, that was the goal of these to eliminate some of the running around that you can get into whenever you're doing remodeling. So we're gonna go through today and we're gonna talk about first, and this is kind of where I lay into a lot of the details of the planning process, uh, design and layout and so forth. We'll talk about some products, uh, timing of the remodel, and, and remodeling timing does vary depending on which project you're doing. Um, kitchens are different than basements, are different than second story dormer type work. Um, We'll give you some idea of the costs we're seeing out there. We've got some before and after pictures, just to kind of show you what can be done. And then we've got some resources for you. When we start a project, um, our, every project that we do starts with basically the same design process flow. Um, and, and as you're looking at these spaces, what we'll do is we'll come have a meeting at your home. Um, that's our sort of uh, free upfront meeting to meet with you about what you want to accomplish, look at the existing conditions of the home, get some measurements and some photographs, and from that we can create a ballpark estimate. Our estimate is line item. As you're looking at starting these projects, this step of measuring out the square footage, putting a list together of the things you'd like to do to that space um, can be really helpful on your own because then if you're going, if you're doing it yourself and you're meeting with different trade partners, if you're visiting the big box stores, you've gotten some idea of square footages, uh, photographs can help so that you can describe to people what you'd like to have happen. In our case, we'll do the photographing and, and uh, estimating and then email back a line item estimate uh, because oftentimes these things end up being more than what people conceive of initially. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, a well done project and the budget that ties to it makes sense for homeowners. Um, sometimes we'll do that second meeting in the showroom to look at products, inspirations, and ideas. Other people would just prefer to get to the, the layout of the project before they get into product selection. We do have, after we do this preliminary part, we have a design and planning fee. Um, it's about 2% of the projected project price. So if you're looking at a $30,000 basement, it's going to be a $600 design and planning fee. For us, that takes you through all the selections, uh, the site visits, say we're doing a bathroom in the basement, we gotta have the plumber there, we wanna make sure that we know what we're getting into before we get to a contract, um, and that kind of thing. Uh, this fee would cover our drawing, some of our drawing time and some of our design time. It also makes sure that the homeowners are on board uh, to work together. Then we go through the process, which the next few slides will detail, initial plans, selections, more detailed plans. Price and contract are pretty important. As you can see under the design piece, we're trying to figure everything out before we get to a contract. So that hopefully with Castle, when you get to a contract, we'll have a guaranteed completion timeline because we've worked hard to figure out all the details. So we'll say 30 working days, we're out of here, otherwise we owe you $40 a day. We also really want to limit any change orders once we reach a contract. So we do a lot more upfront planning 
than some of the other builders. They'll leave more allowances in there. I don't want an allowance for your, your carpeting or, or your tile. I want an actual selection so that we can get the price for that tile or for that carpeting. Uh, the other thing in basements is depending on the condition of your floor and whether it's bumpy or smooth and it's you know concrete, finding a material that works well uh, to cover that space is really important in the design process. So we do a lot of that up front. And again, as you're looking at these spaces yourself and you kind of see what I walk through, as much of that information as you can collect, draw, take pictures of and notes up front is pretty critical. We use a software called uh, Chief Architect. It's a pretty expensive CAD related software. So these would be some preliminary conceptual plans based on uh, a, a given basement layout. Um, and you're looking really at the layouts, the traffic flow. Um, in a lot of the older homes, you're gonna have a furnace in one place, you're gonna have an electrical panel over here and a gas input over there. So you may want spaces to turn out a certain way, but unless you're interested in moving a furnace, we need to work around the mechanicals that are there. Um, you can see in this case, in the media room, they built a little closet around a gas meter. So there's ways you can hide what's there. Um, so doing some initial sketches and drawings and moving the spaces around at this phase can help you decide how to get the best layout for you, for what the house already is throwing at you, um, and move things around and see what makes sense. Um, bathrooms usually are located somewhere near the plumbing stack, that four inch stack you see in the basement. You don't have to do that. But if you move it further away, then you've got to figure out a way to extend that uh, plumbing line below the slab back to where you want your bathroom. When we're working with clients, we'll talk about like a price variation. If the bathroom is not working out right by the stack, what it might cost to move it across the room. This is a, uh, just a 3D uh, axonometric graph of this basement. Um, our software will do this. There's actually some pretty inexpensive softwares online. Uh, that you software online that you can download that'll do for sure decent floor planning um, and some of them will get you into a little bit of the 3d indications of what that space looks like so again it more planning copying what we're doing here by trying to get as much of this thought through on paper and there are some nice little drawing programs that you can get for your home pc that allow you to do some of this stuff here um, we're indicating a point here where we've found a layout uh, we like where the rooms are. We like where the walls are. Uh, we've determined whether or not we need an egress window in a basement bedroom. That's indicated here. That looks like a standard window. Uh, communicating with your city about egress windows is critical. Um, I have had a few situations where uh, it was an office, so it was just a doorway into a room. Didn't have a, a closet in there. And this was in St. Paul, but they called it a bedroom and we had to fight about whether or not they wanted to make the homeowners pay $3,000 for another egress. They already had one in the other room. So that's the tricky one. You can actually see, we've indicated an egress here on the family room. Egress are fabulous for bringing in light, fresh air, and giving you a good sense of not being below grade in a basement. They do cost money. Um, and it's, that's probably one of the biggest things that uh, in the planning process, communicating with the city can really help that you don't make a mistake on how many or where those egress windows go. These are 3D views generated by our PC software. So these are not uh, uh, photographs. These are renderings created by the software. Uh, again, going through the design phase and being able to think through, now we've got our spaces laid out are these cabinets white? Are they cherry? Are they oak? Are they walnut? Um, et cetera. So all the materials that you see here, we work through and we start making selections. Um, another nice way to do this, if you don't have 3D uh, software, is just to find pictures uh, via magazines or the internet. If you use a Pinterest or a house, um, that can be a great way to communicate to a cabinet guy. This is the cabinet style that I'm looking for and getting some help with your vision turning into the reality of the space. But these um, 3D views can be really helpful for homeowners because we can look at the space. A lot of times we've got shortened ceiling heights in basements. We are indicating a beam here. Here's a soffit. There's probably some air HVC running through there. 
Um, and that's pretty important to see because as you envision your basement, those are realities versus up on your main floor, there's less obstruction. So how do those realities affect the space and make you feel about it? This is interesting here where they snuck in a bank of uppers in where, uh, where the HVC softening wasn't. So there's all kinds of cool things you can do to work around it, but it takes a level of creativity. And this software helps us do that with you. Now it's getting into some of the things because we are talking now about how we're finishing these spaces. Um, a lot of basements get an added bathroom. One thing I'll get a call from folks who have an older home and they'll be like, there's a toilet down there and a 50 year old shower room, we wanna update it. Typically that old toilet and that old shower does not have proper legal plumbing venting. So it actually is more in the way than helpful. Um, and so you work through that. Are we adding a bathroom? Are we changing a bathroom? What are some of the costs related to that? But bathrooms and basements are high demand. They're a nice thing to have. Um, when, we get, when we're getting into cabinetry of a basement, one of the big decisions I ask my clients to make as we look at main floor to basement is, are we trying to imitate and create the same design and the same feeling as the, as the main floor down below? Or are you taking this opportunity to give yourself a different feel, whether it's a English bar type feel, or maybe a more of a warehousey type feel where we'll leave the ceiling open and not sheetrock it and just paint it. Um, so the, the first decision is sort of, are we using upstairs as a model or are we really gonna do something creative and different? And that's gonna affect a lot of these choices. Um, when we're down in a lower level, we'll see in the pictures later, I am seeing more white millwork, off-white millwork, even off-white cabinetry, just because of the feeling of wanting to brighten it up down there. That theme will be picked up in the lighting as well. But we're below grade. We probably got one, maybe two egress windows to bring in natural light. So we've got to create a sense of light and comfort in a lot of cases with colors and with products. Um, flooring, flooring's a really interesting concept right now in lower levels. The reality is carpeting is the easiest solution. Um, it rolls nicely over old uh, slabs that aren't exactly flat anymore. Um, it warms up, it creates a, an insulation break between your slab and your feet. Um, that slab's always gonna be about 50, 55 degrees. Basically, once you get below the frost line on the sidewall of your basement, you're just dealing with the general temperature of the ground when it's not frozen. 50-ish degrees all year round. In the summer, that's kind of nice because it's free cooling. In the winter, it can be a little cold on the feet. So carpet easily resolves those two issues, but if there's water in the basement, carpet's not happy. For people with allergies, carpet isn't an ideal solution. And they've done a lot of improvements in the carpets, but carpets do have a lot of the more uh, interesting chemicals that people are trying to, do, to have less in their homes. Um, so then we might get into the vinyls, vinyl tiles, sheet goods, um, things like that. A lot of great products in that arena. Challenge being if you've got a really irregular beat up floor, those products may not be as amenable to bridging the gaps, the cracks and the things like that. So you gotta take a good look at the product you're trying to put down, the condition of the floor. Floors can be filled in. We can use a vinyl patch to smooth over some cracks. Uh, on a few occasions, I have completely redone a basement slab. That is a very demanding, very expensive project, but for the people that have wanted to do that, that's fine. Um, the other thing we're seeing on floors now is just to treat the concrete. Uh, if it's in half decent shape and you can stain it, uh, you can clear coat it, you can even color it. Um, and so that can be the basis of your space. And then you throw rugs on top of it and things like that to keep you warm and cozy. Um, finishes, uh, brush nickel, gray is neutral. Here they're talking about your door knobs, your cabinet knobs, maybe your light fixture trims, things like that. And the brush nickels and the satins are still very popular. Uh, even a shiny chrome is still pretty popular. The oil rubbed colors, the brown colors, we're not seeing as much of again in the basement with that idea of lightening it up. Uh, it just tends to be that the things that are chosen down there really are to try to create a sense of of light and warmth together. And then we get into lighting here. I'm gonna see if there's another line. Lighting in a basement. So as you're thinking about this, if you're doing your drawings and doing your design and you're wandering through the basement, you wanna have lighting, you wanna have good lighting. 
Uh, a lot of the basements uh, and a lot of the lighting of the last 20 years has been sort of driven by the recessed can lights. Um, the reality of recessed cans is they are fairly expensive. Um, they run about 125 to 175 per install. Um, they also create a very conical type of light. The other challenge in a basement is if you've got a lot of mechanical obstructions and you want this nice grid layout for your can lights, uh, the things that are in the ceiling may not allow for that. So can lights are a solution, but I encourage you not to default to them. Um, I think a recessed can down at the bottom of the stairs where you're landing and stepping into the basement, that's when that real bright conical shaped light is great for lighting up the bottom stairs so you don't trip on your face and things like that. But out into the room, uh, my electrician will put in an electrical box that can be switched Box and switch together, let's say, is 120 bucks, whereas the 125 to 170 was just one can light standing alone. And then you can get a ceiling mounted fixture that spread light, spreads light laterally. Um, so two, three ceiling mount fixtures might do the job of six or eight cans and can provide better light. Um, we are getting into some of the LED, uh, some of the low energy, um, long life bulbs in any of these fixtures, whether they're ceiling mounted, whether they're recessed cans. Um, biggest thing with any of the unique lighting is to be aware of how you feel about the cast and hue of that light. Uh, I still, I mean, I'm in the industry and I go to the store and I forget which CFL I liked and I'll buy the one that's too blue and that'll have to go in my daughter's closet because I don't want to look at it anymore. And I'm looking for the one that's warmer. We actually, in the Twin Cities, in the Midwest really, have a unique view on light. We tend to like the light that casts a little bit more yellow-orange. Um, in other parts of the country, they like that brighter white-blue light, which a lot of times they call an outdoor light. Ultimately, it can make a big difference on how you feel about it. So do it going to a lighting store or the Home Depot Menards display where they have all the lights and the, the various ratings of them and so forth is really critical because you can have a fine fixture, wrong bulb, and you're not happy with it. So that's kind of critical here. One other thing that's neat in basements are wall sconces. Uh, because they make things feel longer, they give us a destination, they cast light in a different direction. So as we're trying to make this space bright and habitable and fun to be in, it's just another source of light. And then usually there's some lamps or something like that set up. But that kind of runs down the, uh, the things you want to think about when you're lighting a basement. Other items to consider. Yep. Obviously, when, we're in, when we are in basements, water and moisture is a critical issue. I have an associate who works, uh, Michael Anschel, owns Adagawa Anschel Design. They do a lot of green type design, uh, very earth friendly stuff. Um, and he won't do a basement without somebody first putting in drain tile, period. It's three grand, four grand to put in drain tile. But if you look at some of the basements that even we're doing, I mean, if you're up to thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 investing in a basement that has a bedroom and a bathroom and a, and a family room, um, it makes some sense. But however you do it, you got to be real honest with yourself about the history of water in this room that you're about to bunch, dump a bunch of money into. About 85% of water in basements will be handled with grading and gutters. I think this message is getting out there because I meet with more and more clients and they're like, yeah, we did the gutters last year and we were out last spring grading away from the house. So a lot of people get that. They're doing that for their homes, which does a great job of keeping, as I said, about 80% of the water out of your residential basement. The rest of it probably is a percolating groundwater type of a problem. And the only resolution to that is the drain tile where they literally put tubes around the basement perimeter to collect it, a bucket in the corner to run it into, and a pump to shoot it out. So that system is really expecting that there's always the potential of water and it actively pumps it out of your basement. But before we get in there with uh, nice, expensive, pretty finished products, really important to look at the history of water and moisture in that basement. A lot of it's neighborhood by neighborhood. You'll know, you know if, if your neighbors have issues, it's probably throughout the area. Then as we talked about before, the use of the space and the big rooms we're seeing, the family room, the office, the bathroom, 
uh, more finished laundries, unfinished storage. As much as we're finishing a basement, people will be really anxious about the amount of storage that's left over. So in our design, we deal with that. And again, as you're drawing it out, if there's a nice living room space over here and your mechanicals are more centered on the other side, use that mechanical side, put a wall up, put shelves out and have unfinished storage. Uh, remember that you can maintain storage in spaces that are unique. Maybe it's where the water meter is. Um, so it doesn't have to be dedicated, you know, just for the water meter or just for storage. It could be a combination. Um, and we're also getting a lot of, you know, the bedroom in the basement, usually one. And then egress required in any bedroom. Um, and as I said, be careful with that because the bedroom is somewhat interpretable. The classic, uh, I guess, description would be a room with a door and a closet. Um, but I have run into it where it's a room with a door and they're like, well, you're going to roll a wardrobe in there when we're out of here. So just make sure what the expectations of the local uh, uh, inspecting authorities will be as far as that goes. Yeah, let's get to that. Okay, we've done a little bit of these. Again, the lighting, so critical down there to get it right, uh, to have enough. Uh, to have it controllable via dimmers or separate switches or three-way switches so you can turn those lights that relate to the stair off at the top and the bottom, um, things like that. Insulation, uh, this is the call I'll get where somebody will say, you know, our walls are up and we just want to redo them in sheetrock. And behind the walls is a, oh, a little furring strip that's three quarters of an inch deep by two inches wide. And between each of those is a sheet of old styrofoam. As soon as I crack that, that assembly, I've got to do it again and try to do it the right way. There's been a lot of evolution in how basement walls have been treated and I've been doing it 20 years and just in that 20 years. Um, unfortunately, sometimes codes and expectations are set up without field testing. So a lot, when I started my career, the, jet, the deal was you put a poly vapor barrier, so clear plastic up against the concrete and then you put your studs, and then you put the pink fiberglass in there, and then you put another piece of plastic in front of it. And over time, if you got water into that, it wasn't going anywhere because it's surrounded by two pieces of plastic and soaked up by a big pink sponge. Um, and that was code. That's what we were, you know, we were expected to do, and it did not function well. The minimum today that I'm doing in basements, the sort of entry level uh, assembly, is I'll take inch and a half Thermax foam. So now we're dealing with a foam board, a hard board that won't absorb water. Um, often we use a foil face where it's stuck, it's got foil stuck to the back to it. That'll go up against the, uh, the concrete. So with that, we get a moisture barrier, a little bit of moisture up against that foil face. Uh, um, Thermax won't cause any problems. There's nothing there for mold to eat. It will kind of evaporate back into your block because your basement block is always has a moisture content. Depending on the time of the year, it's pushing a little bit into your home or taking a little bit out, but it will always be breathing a level of moisture. So we want something up against it that will get, not sopping wet, but it will get a moisture to it and we don't want to have a problem. So we do that inch and a half Thermax, then we frame an empty space on the inside of that with two by fours, treat it on the bottom, so that our treated lumber sitting on the concrete floor. Again, there's moisture coming out of that and won't be bothered by it. And then we don't put any insulation in that assembly. What's nice is we can run our electrical through there and it's wide open and the electrician loves us and uh, it looks great. And we don't have anything in there that's particularly amenable to a light water intrusion. If you've got a lot of water in your home, a lot of water coming through, you just gotta consider that before you uh, do the basement. If you have a horrible event down the road where all of a sudden you get water, that's why we have insurance. <laughs> but we're trying to do some things that do eliminate the opportunities for mold to grow, the opportunities for uncomfortable moisture to exist in a basement. And this assembly is, is what I believe to be the best right now. The sort of next step up uh, Lexus version of that is the spray foam. You see some of the guys in the insulating industry out here displaying some of their spray foams. If we can spray that right onto the block for an inch or two and then use a steel stud, you're a little more resistant to water. But you can imagine it still is gonna have sheetrock on it. Even if it's a uh, XP low moisture sheetrock, it's probably gonna have a little base molding on there. Um, so again, a minimal water protection system. If the basement floods, that's why we have insurance. Um, and then I think we talked earlier about that carpet versus hard surface. 
Um, heat sources as well. Do any of you have hot water heat in the home? Yay. Um, I love my hot water heat when it's just heating, but if you have to add to it or change it or anything, it's a pain in the tail. Um, and it doesn't come with air conditioning. Um, so anyway, if you have generally HVC forced air heat, that's pretty easy to run some supplies and returns to each room. Your HVC professional uh, typically will look at the size of the room, determine how many uh, supplies and returns you need, and get that taken care of. So that really, with the Thermax insulation on the outside wall, and the proper number of supplies and returns to either the room or rooms you want to finish, um, that'll give you a very comfortable, very nice space. And that's another one of the things where I'll walk into a basement that was finished 30 years ago and it feels like it's really close. And then I'm, I'll ask them how comfortable it is in there. Eh. Well, they didn't run the right amount of heat supplies. Maybe they ran none. Maybe they cut a hole from the furnace room to the, the rec room and that's all that's coming through. So as you get into trying to create a basement that's very comfortable, um, the, ele the electrical updates, so that you have enough outlets per square foot, the right heating comes into play and it's not just a sheetrock job. Privacy of bathroom door placement. As we get into design and we're doing that layout, uh, one of the key things is, you know, where do you want that bathroom? Is it adjoining a bedroom? Is it more off of a family room for everybody to use? And then we do get questions about sound deadeners in the wall. Uh, if people want to keep the kid noise in the basement, um, if they want to keep the bathroom noise away from a family room. Um, there's some pretty basic ways to sound deaden. You can take insulations, but as I said before, I don't love that below grade. The one that really works pretty nice is called a uh, hat channel. And that's a little piece of metal that the drywaller will supply and install on your studs and then hang the sheetrock onto that. So basically, instead of that sheetrock getting drilled straight to the stud, it gets drilled to a little linear piece of sheet metal that's got a bend to it and keeps that vibration down and reduces the noise. It's really an expensive ad. Most drywallers, it's not a big deal to have them upgrade to that. So when you're looking at budget in a basement, that's a nice way to get sound deadening. Labor dollars. So when Castle, as Ca Castle's been around since 1974, I think, our current owner, Lauren, his father started in 74 and they had a transition and Marty's out, that's the father, he's out playing around in semi-retirement and comes by and bugs us every once in a while. Um, but as we went into the sort of building recession that took place starting in 08, and we're trying to really look at how can we be a better asset to homeowners that want to do construction. And that's really where this basement on a budget came from. One of the things we led with is shared work. Um, before the, you know, when the builders are sort of living high on the hog and everybody had a $100,000 loan on their house to throw at it, um, they generally would say, we'll do the building, stay out of the way, that's the way it works. There are insurance reasons. We're not going to be cutting next to you cutting, et cetera. Um, but, there were, but a lot of it was just because the industry wanted to do things the way the industry wanted to do it. So we get into a lot of sharing. So as we get to our budgeting phase and we're looking at trying to meet a budget for a client, they can do some demo. Um, a lot of them will do painting. That's probably one that hasn't come up yet. Uh, professional painting is expensive, quite expensive. A lot of the times it's worth it. We have had those projects where my designers get done with it, the homeowner painted it, and the designer goes to see how everything looks and they shed a little tear because it just wasn't handled too well. It certainly is something that a lot of people, if they take the time, if they prep right, and prepping is really what painting is all about, can save quite a bit of money. Um, sometimes it's flooring. Sometimes we'll leave the floor left alone and the homeowners will go to a, just a carpet store and, and get flooring installed. As a showroom-based entity, Castle, we provide a lot of products that we are representatives of, we're vendors of. So we're able to get some really nice deals on product. But there are times where scooting off to, uh, what is it, Georgia Carpet Supply or one of those and finding a real basic carpet treats a client better financially and allows them to do the project. And, and we're open to that. 
Uh, and then we'll have clients that either have an uncle who's an electrician or maybe they've done some tile in the past and things like that. So it, again, that sharing of work is, is just fine with us. We'll kind of go through the rules and expectations. If you're gonna take over and do some tile in the middle of our work and we have a timeline guarantee, we might have to alter that timeline guarantee, either stop it and restart it, just because maybe you're gonna paint for a couple weekends in a row, whereas we're there during the week. The other thing that we look at on shared labor is just making sure that we understand where the warranty uh, lies. When we get done with the job, if a client returns the customer comment card, hopefully they're ecstatic and they're all happy and it says all kinds of good stuff, but it certainly doesn't have to. If we get the, the return card, we roll them into a lifetime warranty. Um, we will always come back to a project that we completed and check and see if things falling apart were because of poor install, poor product, poor subcontractor performance or trade partner performance and do our best to fix it. And it's, we're pretty serious about it. The other neat thing about it is clients are pretty cool about it. I don't get a lot of calls where obviously there was a party in the basement and the bottles went through the wall or anything like that. It's usually a good question as to whether this particular product is really doing what it should. Um, so the biggest thing in shared labor is just making sure we understand how that aspect affects timeline and warranty. We do have a nice website, castlebri.com. Um, it has a bunch of resources for places to find products for things that you can do yourself. Again, that's castlebri.com. Um, it also has all kinds of things as far as rough pricings as people start to get an idea what some of these projects can cost. A uh, little bit about our showroom and our team and probably what we've been up to the last few weeks. So it's a nice place to start and get a lot of information. Green's an interesting topic. How are we doing on time? Does somebody have? 11.35? Okay, good. Um, green has evolved quite a bit. Where 15 years ago, it was kind of a new idea. Um, all of your insulation still had plenty of formaldehyde in it. Most of your laminated boards had plenty of formaldehyde in it. Carpeting, paints had vol VOCs, volatile organic compounds. A lot of those things, just because of the sheer demand of consumers, have been reduced or even eliminated. So a lot of what was green back then is now standard practice. With that said, I always interview each client as to what green means to them. Does it mean indoor air quality? Does it mean using a product that's easily renewable? Things like that. And in each of those areas, we can help you focus in on products that will help you. Um, Saving products often is green. Sometimes when products are saved and they have to be aggressively rebuilt to be saved, it becomes a financial challenge to save them. So then it's do the right thing and reuse my door or do the financially uh, sensible thing and buy a new door for less than I'm gonna monkey with this old door. Um, these water efficient shower heads and low flow and things like that, they're all over. That's kind of standard operating now. Um, they do have ones that feel better than others, and so having an awareness of that is probably a nice thing, but they are not hard to find. Um, most of our remodel work is using the PEX piping, the plastic plumbing piping in lieu of copper. Um, it's a little less expensive for the PEX. Um, it goes in faster. It resists uh, some of the uh, freezing and thawing that copper will not tolerate. I still don't like to see a house frozen solid, but if that one gets a little Frosty, it's much less likely to break up. So it's a nice new product, limits the use of copper. Um, talking about leaky windows, you see those ads all the time. Um, and that can be a nice way to, again, if green is being energy efficient, your carbon footprint, if that's your, your sort of hot button in that area, then you talk more about things like this. We talked about the compact, for, compact fluorescence and LEDs. Five years from now, you will buy light bulbs and you won't change them again for the rest of your life unless you hit them with something. And that's a crazy concept, but uh, we're getting close, especially with these LEDs. Uh, they're becoming more affordable. The light ranges on them are becoming nice. The di different decorative details on them are changing, so you can use them in different kind of lights. So that's kind of neat. Um, recycled glass tile. Uh, again, if you like that idea that uh, the glass that comes from 
Oh, some of my recycled glass guys will get glass from mirrors, mirror companies. Uh, one of them gets them from Ikea right over here. They break a bunch of stuff. They put it in a box. They send it to him. He uses it in countertops and tile. And that's kind of a neat way to reuse. It also can re, uh, result in some really cool artistic finishes. Uh, and, and the guy that I have doing that will, he'll let you bring your wedding dishes in. You know, they start to break up. You got five left and you want to preserve them forever. He'll break them up and put them into a vanity top for you. So a lot of really neat ideas on product that maybe isn't recycled from the community, but is recycled from your home and means something to you in that. Um, the sustainable flooring products, marmoleum, et cetera, are another way to go uh, to, to reduce that footprint. But I point out the uh, uh, sort of the conundrum of, um, of uh, I'm going to think of it here for a sec, uh, the East Asian grass that we use in floor coverings. Uh, what? Bamboo, thank you. Bamboo uh, grows incredibly fast. If it's the right bamboo and it's harvested the right way, it's a very tough, very cool looking product. Number one, look out, there are places where it isn't harvested right and isn't built into the right kind of product. But it can be a great product, but majority of it grows in Southeast Asia, so then we ship it over here. Is it still green? I mean, you tell me. So it's an interesting discussion in that area, and most of our paints now are low and no VOC. The biggest time that we get into an issue with a paint type product is if we're doing wood floors and refinishing the wood floors. Um, often that's done with a water-based uh, uh, covering. People usually like to be out of the home for a couple of days for that because that is a, still a little bit stinky. What, what is marmoleum? Marmoleum is, a, uh, it's sold in both sheets and tile. This is VCT, but it's kind of got to look like this in that it's swirled. Uh, you will see it, it really represents the old linoleum that they used to use a lot in homes. It is a linoleum. It is completely natural. It's got, an, it's got a characteristic to it that has an anti-static. And so if you're dust sensitive, this stuff is super easy to sweep up and get the dust off the floor. It comes in tons of beautiful colors. It can be cut in curves and, and you can do some really interesting layouts with it. I just did a Bloomington basement over here in a single color of marmoleum called Painter's Palette. Um, it is pretty comfortable with a little bit of water. So if we do have a basement or maybe once in a while I get a trickle of water across the floor to the drain, um, that's a product that can tolerate some of that. It's a little softer than this VCT. Um, so it's one of the many floor products. We have it on display in our showroom um, that, again, can solve the problem of what do you want in your home, what is the existing conditions of the home, and what products would make sense for that. But it's a, it's a very pretty product. You can, Forbo is the distributor of it, and you can look it up and get some more information. So here's a final plan, and uh, you can kind of see the difference from our early points uh, to where now we've got a lot of notes instructing people for construction. Um, we've really detailed, dialed in the kind of doors, uh, the things that are going to happen, the right size of the door, the swings of the door, how we're squeezing our water heater in here. Um, so again, if you're thinking about this yourself, don't burden yourself. Start with a little sketch of the space, bubble out the plans of where you think things will fit. And one step at a time, add more detail till you get to something like this that would be required to pull a permit, but it's also your instructions for the job. The other thing is if you do something like this and you're meeting independently with plumbers or HVC guys, in other words, you're self-contracting, you'll save a good bit of money over what we charge. You'll also do a lot of work and earn it, and that's fair. But the more instructions, the more specifics that you can have here, the easier you're going to have in comparing bids because they're looking at the same thing instead of just walking somebody into a basement and saying, I need heat. One guy's going to heat it one way. Another guy might heat it another way. They might both be fine. They're two different numbers and you don't know why. So the more specifics that you have in here, if you're doing that kind of thing, can be really helpful. They're all, there are also independent uh, designers out there that'll start with helping you through the design and letting you take over maybe on the construction and contracting side. So there's all kinds of ways to slice this beast up. The other thing is elevations and details. Um, you're not as much gonna get into the details here. This is really 
for us, this is explaining to the city uh, what we're doing. And you can see this is the old drawing with the R13 bat insulation, which I've been with Castle about two years. Uh, they were still doing a little bit of that. The owner, Lauren, who I mentioned earlier, is an MBA from mar in marketing from Carlson Business School. He does a great job of helping us run and be financially responsible and have good marketing, and he can't run a cordless drill to save his life. Um, so right away I said, this isn't happening anymore. We're going to do the Thermax. We're not going to have it. But one way or another, details like this are typically used to describe to the city what our plan is on a technical level so that we can get permitting. The other elevations, which are really critical, and you can see it here in a fireplace, also very true in bathrooms, are, well, on this one place, I need a fireplace, I need a mantle, I maybe need a TV or a picture over the top. I want to do some lighting. There's probably a switch related to it. And if you can draw some kind of a picture of that elevation, you're less likely to come along, want to put your fireplace here and realize the electrician came through and stuck an outlet right in there. And now we got to back up and figure it out. Uh, the other one would be a tile wainscot on a wall in a bathroom where we've got a toilet paper holder. We've got that tile integration. We've got a couple of light switches and just making sure that as each of these people come through and as this project develops, that the first guy knows what the last picture should look like so that he can do his best to put his stuff in the right place and not have to redo it. So those elevations are really critical, even if they're more simple, because this thing happens in steps and the first guy lays groundwork that can affect the last guy. And the joke in the industry is always that the painter will fix it. And that's not really fair to the painter because um, when we work, so here's a good idea of like when we're working, design process four to six weeks, remodeling process five to eight in a basement. That is an unrealistic. We are about 10 to 15% faster because of the time we put into this design. I'll have people call me and say, can I start your bath? I'm ready. I want to start my bathroom next week. And it's like the way we do things, it, it won't happen. So if you want to find a guy who'll come in, start working on your bathroom a little at a time, figure it out as it goes, awesome. Not the way we do it. So there's going to be some planning in there. Then there's going to be the construction when we're in your home, making a mess. Nice thing about a basement is you can close a door on us. Um, and we really believe in the fact that more planning equals a lower chance of surprises. So bat and here is a schedule that we would put together to show a client what we're expecting to do when we expect it to happen. Um, Back to this point, again, if you're taking something on on your own, don't be so excited to pull out the hammers and saws. Think about it. Draw about it. You can see how much time we're putting in as much time thinking about it as we are building on it. Um, and that's really valuable. Uh, you, can get, you can save yourself a lot of headaches by visiting with professionals, doing some drawing, shopping around um, before you get too deep into something that uh, you spent money on and you can't use. This is the homeowner's emotional roller coaster. Um, any way you slice it, remodeling is exhausting for a homeowner. Uh, we get in with our process. I actually find the contract isn't as low, but we do go through this period where we're looking at price versus what a client wants. And I've met with clients with low budgets. I've met with clients that have more money than all of us in the room together. And they're all, all of them run up against the budget, period, because the vision of what they'd like to have typically needs an I, as the builder, designer, contractor, typically more in a position of saying, hey, you said you wanted to spend this, but you're looking at that product, and that's really expensive, and I can get you this. So if the budget's shut, we can do that, but helping to protect that budget. So that process is going on through design. We get to a contract, get started working. It's all exciting. The first few days, the people are in your house. Then as we get through the trades, you don't see as much physical change as they're in there doing the plumbing, doing the electrical rough-ins. So it's not as exciting. We get down here, cabinets go in, kind of tired of having people hanging around the house. Finishes start to happen, party at the end, and then really when we've been gone for a month, that's when people call us back and go, that was okay. Budget considerations. Working within the existing space. In other words, if we don't have to move the furnace, that helps. I have been to, I've been to jobs where I get to the bottom of the stairs and three feet off the bottom of the stairs is the Galdang furnace. So they're already up against the wall. But there are a lot of, you saw the little closet we used around the gas meter. So a lot of ways to work where you don't have to move these things. Sometimes you do, that costs more. Um, existing stairs, um, 
Today's stair codes are very different. I work in a lot of homes that are 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and they've got that stacked staircase that you know, is borderline dangerous to use. In the 1920s, they didn't think we'd be dumb enough to want to live in a basement. They thought that's where the roots went and the furnace, and that's it, and the stuff you don't want to look at. So they didn't necessarily build them to make them easy to inhabit. Anytime you move the stairs or alter the stairs, you can alter the treads and the risers. So you can make them prettier, you can put in more stable treads and risers. When you affect the shape of the stairs, which is called the stair jack, which is where the angles are cut out, you have to meet today's code. So if you're in a home with a short staircase and the new legal staircase at the right angle runs five feet longer, you're cutting a hole in the ceiling up above it to make it work. That becomes a dramatic change to your home. If you don't touch it, it's okay. 85, 90% of the basements I do, we don't touch it. A couple of year we're rebuilding the staircase because it's that bad or because it's a priority for the homeowner. And that is, that's a challenge. It means budget, it means time. We talked about egress windows. They're about 2,500 bucks installed uh, with the metal uh, surround and so on. Um, and again, city will tell you how many you need at a base level. Sometimes it's nice to add one or two because that fresh air and light that you can get into a basement really enhances the environment. Um, stacking the bathrooms, as I said, finding that, that four inch uh, waste, main waste stack pipe and being near there is helpful. Um, I've found that when being near that stack pipe really ruins the overall layout and we gotta move the bathroom, it's about $1,000. Um, so it's not the end of the world, but it's, again, as you're looking at budget, this is where we want to help you figure out what, where is it important to spend $1,000 and really that you'll love the basement, and where is it something that we want to keep it on the not spent side. Um, we talked about some of the floors. I don't advise real hardwoods in the lower level. There are people that are doing it, or at least they're doing some laminates. There's ways to get it done. I don't love it, but if it's important, we can talk to you about it. And, and the real nice pre-engineered hardwood uh, that you'll see on the higher end in the home stores is some beautiful stuff. It usually has 20 coats of finish on it. It's done in a factory somewhere with no dust. It's actually a pretty high-end product. We can come in and lay down on a, on a main floor, uh, you know, fresh hardwood, finish it in place uh, for a lot of times less than the pre-engineered stuff. Uh, challenge being obviously we're finishing it in your home, so they sell it as a fabulous finish on those. Um, so hardwoods uh, can trick you a little bit on, on what they'll cost. Spray foam, insulation as I said, next step up in pricing over the Thermax that comes in the sheet goods that I like to use. But again, we can work through you with you. You can shop at, online, you can shop at the big box stores, especially if you've done some drawing and you know your square footages, you can then start comparing pricing. Um, talking about the moving stairs or changing stairs, what's a ballpark figure for how much that holds? Well, I just did a quickie the other day and we were up at about 10 grand. So, and that one affected the attic and the main floor. It wasn't main floor to basement. The biggest thing is how close are your existing stairs to legal? Because uh, as I said, once we touch them, then every tread is 10 to 11 inches and every riser is seven to eight inches. That's it, it's gotta be in there. Um, where does a landing occur and so on? So it kind of depends on shape, that's some idea. And that's why it's a big deal to get into it. In addition to maybe you're losing some space on your main floor and it doesn't fit. 35K for a basement finish, three quarter bathroom, adding 15 grand. I would say that's fair. The nice full on basements that I'm doing now are 50, 60. Full baths, 18. This is a real quick uh, return on investment uh, document created by, I think, the realtors. I think the folks out of Harvard at the Housing Institute of Research do one as well. A lot of people ask about investment, what, what they'll get back on given projects. This is fairly available. Um, I'm always careful with using this too much. The real estate market is still pretty volatile. I think at right now we're actually seeing higher indicated net values of installs because right now it's hot. You could start a year long project where you think you're going to maximize the value and I just feel like the real estate market is volatile enough that they're a nice indication but I wouldn't live by them and I wouldn't start counting my dollars on how I'm gonna sell my house with the new kitchen and make X amount of money. DSIRE, 
USA.org is one worth writing down. Um, that is a clearinghouse for all of the uh, state government local incentive programs uh, that may come into play on a given remodeling project. Uh, kitchens are going to have less of them than windows and siding, but even in the basement project we're talking about, um, the insulation, maybe the egress, new windows, possibly the uh, a drain tile if that's necessary, but this is a by zip code clearinghouse of the items that are available uh, to homeowners to be able to get a little bit of money back or low, maybe low interest loans and things like that. D yep, uh, D S I R E U S A dot org. Desire USA. I don't know what that has to do with uh, construction, but what the heck. But yeah, DSIREUSA.org. A bunch of salvage and reuse places. These can be great places to either drop off products that you're no longer interested, get a tax write off, and uh, have somebody else reuse them. And they're also wonderful resources for uh, um, maybe finding some things that would be magical in your basement and, uh, and don't cost as much. And we do a lot of that in our design process. These are listed on our website that castlebri.org. Some more tax credit information, the reuse center. I think they still have one more shop. Um, but again, that, that always changes. This is our shameless marketing page, Pinterest, house, our website, all those ways that you can find out about us and about remodeling online. I'm sorry if I'm in the way, let me get out of the way of that. Um, and a lot of people use the Pinterest and house and work with my designers because they're able to post pictures of, it's not the same shape, it's not the same space as what I want, but that's something that makes me feel good, I like it. And then our designers can adapt it. And that's Pinterest. I'm gonna zip through this a little bit, virtual pin board. Yep, and you can, that's the key, is you can really look at a lot of, you can put in a keyword and look at images that other people have done. Basement examples and ideas. Let's sit down here and do this this way. Um, we'll go through this pretty quickly, but it does show some of the, you know, if you recognize it looking kind of like your basement now, you can see that classic uh, uh, two wide concrete uh, uh, laundry drain that's, that's always a foot and a half, two feet off the back wall sticking into the room. Um, and the old stairs there. So there's a 53 Rambler, unfinished basement, and afterwards, in lower levels, we're doing a lot of that upper left picture of combining laundry and bathroom. It can be a really ni nice way to make use of plumbing rough ends and keeping them efficient. Um, and there's neat designs to have that work out. So that's what you're seeing up top, and down below you're seeing a nice finished rec room. Uh, they do have the recessed can lights, and you will see in a lot of these, that white molding, again, just trying to keep it a little brighter down there. After 700 square feet of space finished, family room, guest bedroom, three quarter bath, laundry area and office area, new egress windows, walls, insulation, the fireplace. That is a challenge. I'll meet with a lot of people on the first meeting and they show me their basement and they're like, we want two bedrooms, a kitchenette, an office, a rec room, and it's, <laughs> So even for yourself, I mean, figure a 10 by 10, 12 by 12 kind of bedroom, start carving that out of the space, see what's left, you know. So it is funny that they do that a lot of times and they haven't even thought of sort of, you could figure out that there's no way five rooms is fitting right here. All right, 53 block foundation, uh, mostly storage. And we got a little bedroom. We, got, we opened up this staircase, which is a really nice finish, even if we don't alter the staircase. Making it warmer and more a part of the basement can be a, a way to make it really comfortable and usable. Uh, again, we're seeing the light mill work. This one does have the recessed cans as well. Um, in this bedroom, there's probably two more cans right here, and I might suggest a single uh, attractive decorative center fixture, which would probably take eight, $800 in, uh, recess cans and drop it down to a lighting bill of two, 250. So that's kind of ways that we can help make sense of a budget. If you love recess cans and the grid work works out in that basement, we can do those too. So we got a master bedroom, bathroom, walk-in closet, egress, 
to the right of the bed there. Family room, rec room. Afterwards again, uh, this one down below now, you see the use of, I'm not sure if that's a VCT just like this or possibly marmoleum, but it looks like it's probably something like what we have here. Uh, a lot of wood paneling. That still would be the same treatment behind it where we would want our Thermax, our insulation break, etc. We want the house to perform right before we make it pretty. Um, and then just uh, alternate materials there that do look kind of nice. I think this egress here is key to making that area not too dark. Um, and then again, the other realities of basements are working around beams and things like that. Um, and a lot of times our drawings, there's a beam right there. With that drawing software that we have, we can show that to you before you decide to take a big financial leap in a basement and make sure that something like that's okay. New recessed lighting, gas fireplace. Those gas fireplaces kick out a ton of heat. They're really nice. They're very flexible on location as to where they go in the space. They don't even have to be on an outside wall. Um, and so they can be a really nice thing to have. Uh, new flooring, the egress window. We'll do one more. Unfinished storage. So I don't know if any of you guys have this. The walkout basement, um, value added to a walkout basement, in other words, the work you put into it, is better than a basement that's a hole in the ground. We're getting light. It, it is treated more of a, as a living space by the realtors, so it's a nice thing to have. They're very valuable to finish, and we did do one here. Even the lookout basement, where, you, where the dirt's up about half height. Sorry, the next We're done. seminar is starting in one minute. Oh, we better be done. Okay, thank you. All right, well, that's kind of uh, the time we have for today.